Chapter 31 of The Life and Ventures of the Original John Jacob Astor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Martin. The Life and Ventures of the Original John Jacob Astor by Elizabeth Louisa Gebhard. Chapter 31. Founding the Astor Library The circle of literary friends which Mr. Astor had gathered about him brought a charm and zest into his later years. Halleck's inimitable conversational powers, Cogswell's mastery of his mother tongue and his wide and varied learning, Irving's warm affection and sparkling humor, and his nephew, Pierre Irving's, eager interest in all Mr. Astor had planned regarding the great Astorian enterprise, the keen intelligence of his own grandson, Charles Bristed, who absorbed, as only a boy can, through known and unexplored channels, the information, adventure, humor, and imagination of this rare group of men, all conspired to produce an ideal atmosphere. Pierre Irving writes of dining at Mr. Astor's at a time when the conversation turned upon ghosts. Several stories were cited whose reliability had been credited by eminent men. A guest present voiced his surprise that neither Scott nor Dendy, writing of these mysteries, had mentioned the story of Major Blomberg. Two officers had been detailed to sit up with a body in the West Indies. As the night advanced, one officer had passed into an adjoining room, while his companion remained with the body. To the great surprise of the watcher, he saw the corpse slowly rise and approach him, and presently begin to speak. The story told by this visitor from the secret world was of a great wrong which had been kept secret. He had been permitted to return, that amends might be made. The apparition bade the astonished watcher call his companion, and then told of a secret marriage to a girl in Ireland who was expecting a child gave the name of the clergyman who married them, and told how they could obtain evidence. The guest had seen the sworn statement, testifying to the truth of the story he had related. Mr. Irving took the position that the man was not really dead, and that the wrong rested so heavily on his conscience as to rouse him from a stupor. He ended the serious discussion of the subject by his aggrieved statement that he himself had been hardly treated by the ghosts, that he had made efforts to gain their attention more than once, but always failed. Mr. Astor added much curious information and many unique experiences to the conversations which scintillated from the group about his table. But the intercourse of these friends did not begin and end with anecdotes and ghost stories. In these years of leisure, Mr. Astor's still active brain was revolving a new idea. He wished, as he ultimately confided to his son and the circle about him, to express his grateful feelings toward the city in which he had so long lived and prospered by some permanent and valuable memorial. Dr. Cogswell urged the founding of a free public library, which was warmly seconded by the remainder of the group of friends. Mr. Astor's decision was promptly taken in favor of this plan. From the time the library was suggested, it formed a double tie between him and his literary friends. In 1839, Mr. Astor added a codicil to his will bequeathing $350,000 for the library he wished to found. But later, perceiving that this sum would hardly suffice for carrying out the broad schemes already planned, he added another fifty thousand. About this time the great financier had begun to withdraw permanently from the business world, which gave him greater leisure for plans connected with his benevolent purpose. Very soon Dr. Cogswell commenced to purchase, quote, curious, rare, and beautiful books, unquote, for the library that was to be. Mr. Astor placed sixty thousand dollars in his hands, with special view to some libraries abroad about to be offered for sale. When an invitation to reside with Mr. Astor was again repeated, Dr. Cogswell accepted, 
quote, in the hope of advancing the great project, unquote, which lay very near his heart. An agreement was reached, in which Mr. Astor offered Dr. Cogswell, quote, fifteen hundred dollars a year, and a convenient office in town, his regular business to be working for the library, and an occasional appropriation of an hour or two by Mr. Astor, when he so desired, unquote. Mr. Astor now gave Dr. Cogswell carte blanche to buy books at any time, when they could be had on good terms, if suitable for the library. Dr. Cogswell took up his work in a house adjoining Mr. Astor's, going with him to Hellgate in the summer, and continuing to be the old gentleman's kindly and sympathetic companion for the rest of his life. As years passed by, Mr. Astor became more infirm, and Dr. Cogswell spent a larger portion of his time with his old friend. Writing from Hellgate in 1843, he speaks of being provided with every comfort, and for entertainment, quote, every pleasant day we take a steamboat, and while away three or four hours in the inner or outer bay, unquote. Dr. Cogswell's devotion to Mr. Astor was reciprocated, not only by the old gentleman himself, but also by the family he had so long been a part of, between whom and himself there was a warm and tender regard. Many plans were made for the library, both as to the building and the gathering of books. Architects, masons, and contractors were consulted. Both officially and unofficially the project was present in the intercourse between Mr. Astor and his literary associates for a number of years. They planned together that this should be a cosmopolitan library of reference for scholars, and, naturally, in a matter that lay so near their hearts, Mr. Astor's friends were anxious to see their plans materialize before their eyes. But in the man of great enterprises, the blood was growing sluggish. Advancing years and feeble health were producing a natural reluctance to lifting new burdens, and though he was urged again and again by both Irving and Cogswell to begin the work, whose completion in his lifetime they felt would bring him great satisfaction, the donor of the Astor Library evidently believed that the practical labor of founding the institution was for younger hands than his. During these later years Mr. Astor enjoyed being read to, and found in these discerning friends able and vivid interpreters of the world of books, whose opening vistas were his delight. In 1842 Washington Irving was appointed minister to Spain, it was his desire that his old friend, Joseph G. Cogswell, should be appointed as secretary of the legation. Just as he had attained his desire, Mr. Astor awoke to what the absence of both of the friends of the library would mean for so long a period. He thereupon stepped in with a promise to immediately go on with the library, and the offer to Cogswell of the position of librarian of that embryo institution. This change in arrangements was a disappointment to Irving, and a sacrifice to Cogswell. But the library held a warm place in Irving's heart, and he was unwilling to stand in the way of an appointment so eminently suitable. He was also in keen sympathy with the sacrifice Dr. Cogswell was making in the cause of, quote, good learning in the land, unquote. So Washington Irving sailed for Spain, with Alexander Hamilton, Jr. as his secretary, and Dr. Cogswell remained in this country to become the very able and untiring organizer and manager of the Astor Library, and eventually to visit the literary centers of Europe, to make as complete a collection as possible of the books which would meet the needs of advanced students. The building was erected in Lafayette Place, New York City, and the library was opened January 9, 1854, at the same date of the opening ceremonies of the Astor House in Waldorf, Germany. For nearly two generations the Astor Library was a source of reliance and enjoyment to scholars and literary men, both to those who were climbing the lower rounds of the ladder, and also to many who were already famous. It has been, literally, quote, a scholar's court of appeal, unquote, 
and among the earliest of the great city philanthropies for the assistance of whoever would use its benefits. For many years the descendants of its founder continued their gifts to the institution, in land for additional buildings, in donations and bequests of large sums of money, and in the addition of valuable books and paintings. By the incorporation of the Astor Library with the New York Public Library during recent years, the Astor Library has not ceased to exist, nor to continue its beneficent work. John Jacob Astor, as one of the earliest of New York's philanthropists, still offers through this great modern library thousands of valuable books of reference gathered with utmost painstaking through the years of half a century. The struggling youth in the world of letters may still find assistance here, through the generosity of the man who was once a struggling youth himself. The years between Mr. Astor's first thought of an offering of public benefit to the city of his adoption, and the final completion and opening of the Astor Library, were years of seed planting in the removal of abuses, in help for the needy, and assistance to those who were trying to climb into better conditions. During these years, Israel Kors, a Quaker leather dealer in the, quote, swamp, unquote, was the leader of a devoted band of men who rid New York of the lotteries which were sapping its life. Through their united efforts the selling of lottery tickets became a crime. The New York Association for Improving the Condition of the Poor was organized in 1843 and incorporated in 1848. Five Points Mission had its inception during the same period. The New York Free Academy, which was later expanded into the University of the City of New York, was opened in 1849. The YMCA in 1852. The Children's Aid Society in 1853. The St. Luke's Hospital in 1854. And the cornerstone of Cooper's Union was laid the same year. Among the great crowds of the Old World population, which had sought the shores of the, quote, new land, unquote, with hope and large expectations in their hearts, were many who had not met with success. Some could not adapt themselves to new conditions. Others were not rugged enough for the rough life of a new country. Some had been trodden upon by the fierce striving of others in the race, while a large number had simply not made good and their children started life as handicapped as their parents before them. This was the bright dawn of a day when men turned from holy self-aggrandizement to consider the less fortunate or striving brother at their elbow, turned with what, for their time, were munificent gifts in their hands. All honor to the men who, like John Jacob Astor, took these first steps along a path that has made a half-century glow with a wealth of organized charities and philanthropic endeavors. In comparison with our own time, the gifts may not seem large, but they broke a trail which has opened out into a great white light of beneficent enterprise. End of chapter 31 Recording by David Martin Section 32 of The Life and Ventures of the Original John Jacob Astor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Life and Ventures of the Original John Jacob Astor by Elizabeth Louisa Gebhard. Chapter 32 Gathering the Threads Together. Like the ships ever sailing by his home, at the gate of Long Island Sound, bound for some safe harbor, so Mr. Astor's life glided quietly away in this ideal retreat for the evening tide. He had passed the turmoil and the storms of life, and the dangerous reefs, and was sailing into port. The great venturer died on the morning of March twenty ninth, 1848. The funeral took place from the home of his son, William B. Astor, in Lafayette Place 
being conducted according to the liturgy of the Episcopal Church, in which church many of his children and grandchildren were communicants. The pallbearers, David B. Ogden, Judge Oakley, Washington Irving, Ramsey Crooks, Isaac Bell, Sylvanus Miller, James G. King, Albert Gallatin, Jacob Taylor, and Philip Hone, represented by their names and personalities, their sympathy and cooperation in the varied interests and activities that had filled the life of this remarkable man. The gathering of Mr. Astor's great fortune, with its daring ventures and ultimate successes, had been a matter of interest to a vast number of people during his lifetime. How he had disposed of it at his death held their attention no less. In the course of sixty years, John Jacob Astor had accumulated an estate, which was variously estimated to be from twenty to thirty million dollars. He was accustomed to say, the first hundred thousand dollars, that was hard to get, but afterwards it was easy to make more. Not over two million of his large fortune came as the fruits of the fur business, lucrative as that business had been. By far the larger part of the first Astor estate was the result of the founder's clear-sighted vision as to the future of New York City, and in consequence his large investments in real estate. As has been already said, Washington Irving, together with other of Mr. Astor's friends, were made his executors, and also trustees of the Astor Library. Much as the great financier loved and admired his adopted country, he had retained a few old-world ideas which had not been shaken by the experiences of life, or a different environment from that of his youth. The bulk of his property he passed down to his son, William B. Astor, who had already inherited a large fortune from his uncle, Henry Astor, making him the richest man in the New World. The blood tie was very strong in this German-American. The most generous instincts of his heart were wound about his family and those near of kin, and not only his son William B., but all others connected with him, children, grandchildren, nephews, and nieces, were remembered in his will, with an evident desire to comfortably provide for them all. Even the descendants of the brother who had stayed in Germany, John Melchior Astor, were left annuities. For his unfortunate son he made careful provision in the building of a house for him in 14th Street, near Ninth Avenue, which was to be his for life, with ample provision for the most solicitous attention. A pathetic touch in this particular bequest was the clause which stipulated that if his son should ever be restored to the use of his faculties, he was to have an increased yearly income of $100,000. This fond hope of a father's heart was never fulfilled but the tenderest care for the unfortunate one was evidenced in the plans made for him. Mr. Astor's legacies to benevolent objects were as wise and practical as they had been through life. The $400,000 for the Astor Library was the largest bequest, followed by the $50,000 for the Astor House in his native village. To the German society, which he joined soon after coming to America, and to which he was ever loyal, he gave thirty thousand dollars, on condition of their investing it in bond and mortgage, and applying it for the purpose of keeping an office, and giving advice and information, without charge, to all immigrants arriving in New York, and for the purpose of protecting them against imposition. This element of looking backward, and smoothing the rugged path for others, over which he himself had courageously trodden, was conspicuous in the great financier's plans and bequests. To the home for aged ladies he gave thirty thousand dollars. The blind asylum and half-orphan asylum, and the German Reformed Church, of which he was a member, were also remembered. The will was considered by many to show good sense and good feeling, and where it failed to meet certain obligations, Mr. Astor had left his son, William B., a living representative who in a number of cases added to his father's bequests, and as years went by continued his interest and his gifts to the benevolent objects in which his father had been interested. From youth to old age John Jacob Astor had a remarkable personality. His formative years held unusual phases of character building. There were the years of impressionable boyhood when he held bravely to a star of hope, which shone only fitfully in the gloom of his environment. There were years in an unknown country, with a strange language about him, when he clung to a purpose 
which required unending industry, unwearied patience, unswerving loyalty to the right. Believing in these years that knowledge was power, he used every means at his command to train his mind for future usefulness. Once more he stood the test in a strange land, surrounded by hundreds of visionaries and schemers, and young men who had thrown off the yoke of home influence to live a free life in a free land. Here again he bent his energies to the acquisition of knowledge through all the avenues open to him, and these avenues of education and cultivation grew in number as his life broadened and progressed. It was these early years and tests which in the end identified the name of John Jacob Astor with ideas of honesty and industry, boundless energy, and untiring enterprise. To these he added, as his life was more and more intertwined with that of his adopted country, patriotism and public service. Something of an inherited courage and daring projected into new channels called John Jacob Astor out from the old life and imbued him at an early age with a vision of success. Earnestness and faith accompanied him like a bodyguard. They lifted him over obstacles and spurred him on to fresh exertion after each repulse. As the years went by, his enthusiasm fired others, thus carrying into new regions American rights and interests, and turning the hearts and minds of men to the great West. Running parallel with the desire for personal benefit in his great enterprises was a deep-seated loyalty and patriotism toward the young republic of which he was a part. Irving writes of Mr. Astor. He began his career, of course, on the narrowest scale, but he brought to the task a persevering industry, a rigid economy, and strict integrity. To these were added an inspiring spirit that always looked upward, a genius bold, fertile, and expansive, a sagacity quick to grasp and convert every circumstance to its advantage, and a singular and never wavering confidence of signal success. His friend and intimate companion, Joseph G. Cogswell, gives this brief description of the great financier. He was a man of fine personal appearance, his features bearing the stamp of intellectual sagacity, and of commanding and pleasing address. He also adds, John Jacob Astor's liberality was princely. Still another writer says of the great financier, He was a shrewd and enterprising man of business, yet large-hearted and public-spirited to a fault. Others, in speaking of his face, have said it showed a spirit of meditation, patient courage, masterful resolve. He concentrated his thought and all his resources on the object he wished to attain. He relied upon his own judgment rather than that of others, but not without the fullest information he could gain in regard to any of his operations. He was fond of saying, an ounce of practice is worth a pound of theory. Ingenuity in making the most of an unexpected opportunity often saved the day for him, when a less ingenious man would have failed. Supporting his many valuable mental characteristics was an iron constitution, whose staying powers were tested over and over again to the limit of his reserve strength. Judged by the standards of his own day, John Jacob Astor's public benefactions were generous. It is a question whether he may be considered behind or ahead of our time, in his devotion to his family, even to its furthest outstanding branches. In regard to the Astorian enterprise, Arthur Butler Hulbert says, The spirit which John Jacob Astor showed has been the making of America. The first American promoters, while seeking personal benefit, were moved by considerations of loyalty and patriotism, equaled by businessmen in no other country at any time. One of the strongest encomiums which can be passed upon this noted man, with extraordinary talents, untrained in the schools, but utilized in their virile freshness to the full extent of the gifts, is that he spent his life piling up opportunities for those who would follow him. He accomplished great things in his lifetime, and all that his years of incessant and absorbing work left no time for undertaking be made possible for his descendants. To an unbounded degree this remarkable man loved his adopted country, 
his home and his kindred, and John Jacob Astor still lives in the paths he opened for those who came after him. End of chapter 32 Recording by Pamela Krantz